Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains graphic depictions of war, rape, racism, and violence. As the scattered remains of the 1915 Sepoy Rebellion in Singapore were being stomped out, Japanese politicians and media praised their country's armed forces. The way they framed it, Japan alone prevented complete anarchy in Singapore. There was no mention of the countless French or Russian volunteers and sailors, nor the hundreds of British militia which rapidly mobilized to protect its citizens who lived in Singapore. During World War I, Japan was one of Great Britain's allies. They fought several actions in German-controlled areas of China, but these battles were minor when compared to the overall conflict. For decades now, Japan had been rising as a world power. Emperor Meiji's reign in the late 19th century, bore witness to rapid modernization, the likes of which had not been seen up to that point. The rapidity of change was bracing for the conservative and isolationist Japanese. But the benefits of modern life eventually brought stability to Tokyo once more. They turned outward, intent on glorifying Japan or dying in the effort. They started small at first, annexing the Ryukyu Islands to their south in 1879. Then they turned west toward China and specifically Korea. The First Sino-Japanese War saw the further expansion of Japanese influence in Korea. But their ambitions in China were curbed by Western powers. Russia, France, and Great Britain rushed to split apart the once mighty Middle Kingdom. To state the opinion of Trevor N. and R. Ernest Dupuy, quote, European imperialist diplomacy sowed the seeds of future war, unquote. In the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese forces completely destroyed the Tsar's navy and fought his armies to a bloody standstill in Manchuria and Siberia. Japanese influence was clearly snowballing all over Asia. In Great Britain, the exact opposite was true. Following World War I, the Great British Empire was beginning to fray, not at the edges, but from within. On the home front, the first ever Labour Party government was sworn in. It was clear the priorities of British citizens had changed drastically. Now they wanted peace, health care, and to be left alone. Just across the North Channel, a clandestine war was being waged between British security forces, the Black and Tans, and the Irish Republican Army. Britain chose to retain part of Ireland and was given large tracts of land in the Middle East following the 1918 peace. The people of Britain, however, demanded disarmament, making defending these new lands nearly impossible. As if to make matters worse, the world's main source of energy was changing. Now oil was the number one commodity on the world market, and it rapidly supplanted coal. This suited America perfectly, as the country has a massive supply of fossil fuels. America quickly became the number one trading partner for the Crown Colony of Singapore. Britain still had a massive presence there in the form of textiles and other traditional industries, but American companies were utilizing Singaporean tin and rubber with ever-increasing demand. With the emergence of oil as the number one energy provider and the discovery of oil in nearby Malaya, Singapore took on its modern role as a massive petrol port. This change was a welcome one for sailors, who now had more free time and space. One sailor wrote of the change, quote, 
That night, I took a shower all by myself. Here was something I had dreamed of. Back in the old days, I washed three to a bucket, and it was so overcrowded, I was never sure whose leg I was washing." Unquote. The population of Singapore began to boom as more people made the island their permanent residence. Life was busy. The Chinese benefited the most from Singapore's position and trade practices. The poorest began growing pineapple instead of rice, and the community savings were growing. Instead of sending their money back to China, which was in a constant state of upheaval, they invested in the local economy. The local economy was in turn fed by the world markets. In spite of this growth, capital was still lacking across much of the island, as many banks refused to lend money to any Asian person. Those who profited most were, of course, the ultra-minority of British businessmen and colonial managers. These Britons were seeing a rapid change in Singapore. The Chinese, Malay, and Indian peoples had all ceased wearing their traditional clothing in favor of a more westernized wardrobe. While the British were increasingly found fraternizing with the locals and even drinking the local cocktail, the pahit. These abnormalities in the way of life of everyday people had a lot to do with the Great Depression. When it struck, world markets were completely crippled, Singapore being no exception. In one instance, two British brothers opened a shoe shine stand to make ends meet. The British authorities had the shop shut down, saying, quote, Shoes were not shined by white men in the Orient. Unquote. Singapore was now integrated economically and politically with Malaya, as the causeway between the island and the mainland opened in 1923. More goods could now be sent from the resource rich hinterland to Keppel Harbor. The multi decade alliance between Japan and Great Britain ended ignominiously in 1922, and British naval men quickly recognized Singapore's precarious position. They asked for the funds to build the Sembawang Naval Base, a massive structure designed to house, entertain, and maintain over 2,000 personnel. Its construction would be hampered by terrain constraints, a lack of funds, and the Great Depression. When finally finished in 1938, Semba Wang was said to be part of a greater, quote, fortress Singapore, unquote, though the structure could not truly be considered a fortress by any means. Before it was Fortress Singapore, the island had long gained a reputation as a hedonistic paradise. Depraved and debauched British army and naval personnel ran amok on the island. One account ruefully recalls, quote, On Saturday, we might dance in the ballrooms or the club or perhaps visit the happy world. And though the girls were known as taxi girls, there was no way one could get them into a taxi. I know because I tried, unquote. These atrocious scenes played out across bars and brothels and would only become worse with time. Singapore's skyline was beginning to reflect that of a city like New York, while American companies like Ford opened the first car assembly plant in Asia, right in Singapore. In Fort Canning, another massive military fort was constructed based on the designs of many of the French fortifications on the Maginot Line. On the eve of the Second Great War, Singapore was studded with 29 pieces of heavy artillery, and all but two of these guns had 360-degree swivel capacity. They came just in time, in 1937. Following years of aggression, Japan invaded China, starting the Second Sino-Japanese War. The British falsely believed this would remove Japan as a threat to their vital resource-rich underbelly. This was about when Arthur Percival first arrived in Singapore, as the chief of staff of the small garrison. Arthur Percival was the quintessential caricature of a British officer. He was long and gangly, attributes that were only enhanced by his British regulation khaki short shorts. He also sported a pencil mustache and short, closed-cropped 
brown hair. But in spite of his somewhat comedic appearance, Percival was a true war hero. He served with distinction in World War I, where he nearly died in the Battle of the Somme. Following the war, Percival was a member of the British Expeditionary Force, which was sent against Bolshevik Russia. Here, he captured a Russian position with a surprise attack and a vigorous outflaking maneuver through dense forest. Next, he was deployed in Ireland to help track down two cop killers. This garnered him the fury of the IRA, who placed a 1,000-pound bounty on Percival's head. The acting governor of Singapore, Sir Shenton Thomas, was the main middleman between military and civilian affairs. By all accounts, he resented the influx of sailors and soldiers coming to the island. He felt that this increase in men and arms could only hurt the economy of the island. Additionally, he never believed the Japanese could challenge the British position in Southeast Asia. The Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and most recently the Germans had all failed. There was no way Japan could challenge British might on the ground, in the sky, or on the waves. By the end of 1938, British Hong Kong was a small outcove in a Japanese-controlled ocean. China was beaten and battered, forced to concede the entire coastline. Chinese soldiers fought with ferocity and bravery, but infighting, the lack of air force, and an incompetent officer corps led to repeated Chinese defeats. In Nanking, the garrison resisted stubbornly. In the occupation which followed, up to 230,000 people would be murdered, raped, and assaulted in what is known to history as the Rape of Nanking. Britain was still attempting to appease Hitler with the Sudetenlands. In Asia, Britain would attempt a similar bargain with Japan, mandating that Singapore's pro-Chinese newspapers be censored and forced to stop referring to the invading Japanese as, quote, shrimp barbarians, unquote. Neville Chamberlain and the British public at large came to realize that there is no way to appease a fascist government. As 1939 began, Britain began to understand their precarious position on the world stage. They finally increased rearmament efforts and sent a paltry 100 aircraft to defend all of Malay. Among these hundred planes were two squadrons of wildebeests, torpedo-armed biplanes. These planes were designed to target enemy shipping and transports. Their top speed was just under 200 miles per hour. The closest thing the British had to a fighter plane were a handful of decrepit yellow Hawker Hearts, which were basically obsolete and only used for training. There was no coordination between the Air Force, Navy, and Army. Everyone was a boss unto themselves. Military bureaucracy and intra-service rivalries were a huge hamper on many armed forces across the globe as the war began. Those who adapted came out better for it, and those who didn't ceased to exist. Among the first reinforcements were the Highland Argyles, or the 93rd Regiment of Foot. The tradition of this regiment goes as far back as the Argyle region, and the regiment was often the only home many of its members had ever known. A month after their arrival on the island, Hitler's Wehrmacht invaded Poland, and the Second World War began in earnest. Many in Singapore were bitter that they were stuck in an out-of-the-way corner of the globe while their friends and family suffered daily bombing attacks from the Luftwaffe. The Japanese were never going to enter the war against Britain. They were trying to invade Soviet Russia, but received the bloody nose from a hitherto unproven marshal named Zhukov. A month following the start of these hostilities, Singapore unveiled its first skyscraper, the Cathay Building. On the ground floor, the Wizard of Oz enraptured Eurasian audiences with its brilliant technicolor. Singapore remained in this dreamlike state, unable to fathom the cruelty and bombings of major cities. People were markedly indifferent or deeply frustrated. They were not on the Western Hemisphere fighting Hitler and Mussolini.
Following the invasion of the Low Countries and the destruction of the French army, Britain stood alone for the first time since 1808, when Napoleon had attempted to usurp British economic power with his own continental system. In French Indochina, the Japanese began putting the screws to the local government, demanding the use of air bases and naval yards for their Chinese armies. These were agreed upon reluctantly, and the Indochinese government continued to make constant efforts to undermine Japan. For those Malay and Indian nationalists among the populations of Southeast Asia, Japanese occupation was not considered a bad thing. Many actually welcomed it, believing Japanese propaganda. Many thousands of Indians and perhaps a few Malays fought for the imperial Japanese armies. They wanted freedom for their homeland and were willing to sacrifice notions of human rights and democracy to get it. Considering the behavior of the British in India and the Dutch in Indonesia, it's little wonder so many native people sided with fascists who promised some autonomy instead of liberals who promised more of the same Eurocentric racist rule. As these battle lines were forming, the Malaysian Peninsula continued to reinforce. Australians had just begun arriving. They brought with them more planes, including American-made Hudson bombers, as well as Australian Whirlaways, which were mediocre trainer planes. This paltry force was upgraded with the addition of an aircraft designed in Long Island, New York, dubbed the Brewster Buffalo, a.k.a. the Flying Barrel. These Navy-designed planes looked as their nickname suggested. They were bulky and powerful, but they were in no way able to compete with the Japanese Zero Fighter, or even the German Messerschmitt. The Western powers had no idea about the Japanese-designed planes. They considered the Japanese Air Force to be, quote, Bush League, unquote. In fairness, Japanese aeronautics were lacking in modern design, but the genius of Dr. Hiro Horikoshi changed all that. His aforementioned plane, the Zero Fighter, was state-of-the-art, maneuverable, and built to last. The Zero left many Europeans shocked. They believed this had to be a German design, maybe even Italian. They did not anticipate the storm which would be coming. Following these Australian planes, thousands of ground troops from Australia arrived to further bolster the forces of the Malay Peninsula. These 6,000 were led by the braggadocious war hero Major General Gordon Bennett. As 1941 began, Europe was still under Hitler's thumb, but the London Blitz was now relegated to nighttime bombing runs. In North Africa and the Middle East, Italian armies were repeatedly stymied by the well-led men who served under Archibald Wavell. In Singapore, Bennett's Australians were becoming press darlings. They were often front page, while their British and Indian counterparts were hardly recognized. In Europe, Yugoslavia was plundered by marauding panzers, and Greece was finally overrun after a combined Italian-German offensive. In Crete, the British expeditionary forces fought bravely, but they were destroyed. Outside Crete, German dive bombers wreaked havoc on the Royal Navy, sinking the HMS Kelly. Naval warfare was changing. In Southeast Asia, the Japanese armies complained that, as they advanced, they were being surrounded by the Americans, the British, and the Dutch. An anonymous note on the margin of this complaint reads, quote, Once again, one cannot help thinking that if one is advancing into a wood, one is apt to be encircled by trees." Unquote. Japan had come under the leadership of Tojo Hideki, who was still nominally referred to as the chief of the army. The emperor sat in a position of divinity, but held a largely ceremonial role. Japan's main reason for entering the war was oil. America had put an embargo on trade from Japan and considered cutting the nation off from the vital supply of oil it needed. Japan felt these terms were an attempt to turn them into an American tributary state. To state the opinion of Colin Smith, author of Singapore is Burning, quote, The oil weapon could be applied any time Roosevelt felt like it. 
Japan would become like a dog on a leash, jerked to obedience whenever its master wished. Unquote. It was decided that the so called Southern Resource Area had to be acquired in order for Japan to hold its head above water. To do this, war would need to be waged against the Dutch, the Americans, and the British. The invasion of Malaya would be planned by the fanatical war criminal Colonel Masunobo Suji. To invade Malaya, Suji understood that the elements and the climate itself would become a major enemy. To combat this, he began using the Chinese island of Hainan as a training base for jungle warfare. The troops were equipped with small motorcycles for scout transport and, most famously, thousands of bicycles. As a final addition, Hisuji printed out thousands of field manuals filled with helpful hints, do's and don'ts for troops once they arrived in Malaya, and propaganda. In the manual it reads, quote, Regard yourself as an avenger. Come at last face to face with his father's murderer. Here before you is the man whose death will lighten your heart, and the first blow is the vital blow. Unquote. All was ready. Come December 7, 1941, Imperial Japan would begin to orchestrate its own demise. Back in Singapore, preparations for the war were underway, regardless of the possibility that it would not come to pass. Percival had returned to lead the island's ground forces after several years spent in Britain. Air Marshal Pulford was in charge of the Air Force, while the naval dockyard was run by Rear Admiral Edward Spooner. The British government promised that over 300 planes would be sent to Malaya. By autumn 1941, barely half of these reached the peninsula. And the ones that did would never be able to protect the skies from any Japanese attack. The British plan, Operation Matador, was to launch a preemptive invasion of neutral Thailand, thereby cutting off possible landing sites for any Japanese marines and garrison the seven separate Malayan airfields. Beyond this, there was no plan. They were to hold until the Royal Navy arrived to protect and reinforce them from the sea. In the meantime, the RAF would maintain air superiority. However, even Operation Matador was not initiated. The overall commander-in-chief was not allowed to make the final decision until hearing back from London. In the end, London felt this plan was too bellicose. They were already facing blowback for their invasions of Syria and the stamping out of the Iraqi fascist revolution. The SOE, or Special Operations Executive, were Britain's last hope. These British special forces played a huge role in counterinsurgency and espionage among occupied Axis countries. They are responsible for the first recorded use of the well rod, the world's first silenced pistol, as well as the introduction of the Thompson submachine gun, aka the Tommy gun, to Allied forces in Malaya. On top of all this, the SOE's main objective was to supply and facilitate stay-behind parties. These were armed bands whose objective was to literally stay behind if Malaya were to fall into enemy hands. They were to ambush, gather intel, and sabotage whenever possible, living off the land and the connections they built in the local underground. War inched closer, and men bristled with anxiety. The majority of them were Indian citizens, barely old enough to be considered men, they were led by British officers who didn't even speak their language. It's true, there were a few Indian commissioned officers, but they were few and far between, and they were often derided by both their British counterparts as well as native Indian troops. The true backbone of the army were the aforementioned Australians and the Highlanders of Argyle. It was now November, and all around Malaya there was activity and troop movement. The most frenetic work was being done in and around Kota Baru, a scenic beach town in northeastern Malay. Among the palms and white sands, trenches were being dug, and barbed wire was being laid. These preparations were greeted with the arrival of two British warships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. 
The Prince of Wales was the pride of the fleet, only just completed in British naval yards in 1939, while the Repulse was a World War I-era vessel which had taken part in the sinking of the infamous Bismarck. They were greeted by immense fanfare. Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, nicknamed Thumb for his height, was in charge of this eastern task force. He was a member of the Old Guard, who wholly believed in the power of battleships and detested the new aerial-based doctrine of naval thinking. His friend and fellow admiral, Arthur Harris, once said to him, quote, One day, Tom, you'll be standing on a box on your bridge, and your ship will be smashed to pieces by bombers and torpedo aircraft. As she sinks, your last words will be, that was one fucking great mine. Unquote. The garrison of Singapore and of Malaya was still woefully under-equipped. Not a single tank that was promised arrived, and the 300 frontline aircraft they were promised turned out to be a hundred odd old biplanes. Meanwhile, Suji was putting the final touches on his plan of attack and prepared to present it to his commanding officer, Tomoyuki Yamashita. Yamashita was the son of a country doctor. He went into military school early on and quickly excelled in his studies. He was well-read and scholarly, having spent a good deal of time in Europe. His experiences there shaped the man and his tactics, and he was one of the few in Japan's officer corps who believed in modernization. Yamashita was devoted to his work and worshipped his emperor. It's said that upon arriving in a new office, he would triangulate the position of the emperor's palace and point his desk that way. Following a failed coup, Yamashita fell out of the government's favor, but after the war began in China, he was recalled. As a division commander, he led his men from the front, a great personal hazard, something which was truly unique for the era. He would follow his emperor's instruction to the death as Tokyo planned simultaneous invasions of Malaya, the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Wake and Guam Islands. The most telling scene of Yamashita's life occurred just before hostilities with the West commenced. While at a hotel which doubled as a brothel, the headmistress sent her own daughter to the general's room with the message, quote, I have ordered her to do whatever you want, unquote. Yamashita turned the young girl away, saying, quote, She's a victim. Unquote. Yamashita had the elite 5th and 18th Division placed under his command, as well as the Emperor's own Guard Division. Unlike the British, he was supplied with every conceivable piece of equipment. Over 200 tanks were made available for the invasion, as well as over 600 mostly state of the art planes. The plans for war were an open secret to British and American high command. For some time, American codebreakers had broken the Japanese coding through an ingenious encryption device called MAGIC. This gave invaluable information to the British about Japanese buildup and movements. Regardless, the Japanese were blessed with the gift of bad weather, which covered their approaches. While out on patrol, an RAF Catalina spotted the convoy. The plane was shot down and the seven members on board became the first casualties of the Eastern War. Between this time and the first Japanese landings, Operation Matador could have been in full swing. There were more than warnings. Still, however, neither Commander-in-Chief nor Percival would okay the preemptive invasion. Then suddenly, all hell broke loose across Malaya, but especially in Singapore. Japanese bombers, unnoticed by shoddy radar, had free reign in the sky as they pounded the city's port. Fires sprang up as sailors desperately fumbled at a substation to shut off the electricity. Unfortunately, many hoses were powered by electricity, so the fires were now able to grow without restraint. The street lamps still illuminated the city streets, as they were gas-powered. The night watchman, who was the only person to hold the key which turned off the lamps, was conveniently missing. War came as a shock to many Singaporeans, among them the Japanese residents of the city. They were the first to be rounded up and have their property and assets forfeited to the colonial government. The initial bombings were over in a few minutes. In the wreckage, over 60 people were killed, and 100 more were seriously wounded.
At Kotobaru, the Japanese had landed a surprise attack. The common soldiers were completely thrown off guard by the initial cracks of bullets and naval support fire. Some even believed it was just a training exercise, only to later realize the war was only a minute down the road. The Indian forces defending the beach quickly found their composure and began delivering devastating machine gun fire from their Bren and Lewis guns. Subject to a withering crossfire, the first Japanese soldiers on the beach were nearly wiped out to a man. Through sheer force of will, they slowly gained ground, and as more and more Japanese soldiers landed, they began to overwhelm the forces they met on the beach. Sea spray, sand, and burning cordite mixed together in the British pillbox, making soldiers' eyes burn. It is the opinion of some veterans that the Japanese forces were also using chemical weapons in this first battle. Because, by the end of it, all the Malayan forces were donning gas masks. In response to this surprise invasion, six RAF bombers took off from the nearby airfield in an attempt to down any ship they could find. This was the first action in which any of the young Australian pilots had participated. In one run, Oscar Diamond pulled his Hudson bomber into a near standstill, put up his landing flaps, and passed so low over the Ayatsosan Maru that upon dropping his payload, his bomber's tail was lifted from the ensuing blast, nearly careening Oscar into a watery grave. However, the bravery of the Australian pilots and Indian infantrymen was not enough to hold the beachhead. The Japanese, through force of will, inched their way through minefields and barbed wire emplacements. They got through the latter by literally tunneling under the sand with spoons and shovels. Their progress was hard and bloody, and in truth, their sacrifice was a complete diversion. The true Japanese effort were focused on the beaches of Thailand. Here the Thai army attempted to resist, but many within Thailand held Axis sympathies, and organized resistance rapidly fell apart. Yamashita's plan had gone off without a hitch. Back in Singapore, the mood was jubilant. The high command and the civilian press were incredibly optimistic of their chances, but they overestimated their successes at Kota Baru. Only now did the Zero and its army equivalent, the Oscar, begin to patrol the skies. They found success right away. The first true dogfights of the war began between Australian and Japanese pilots. Kotobaru was rapidly neutralized as a threat, and the Japanese Air Force went to work destroying any other British plane they could find in Malaya. After a day of this, British air strength had fallen to only 50 serviceable aircrafts. This was the catalyst for the mass retreat of any northern British airfield. Now the fight was for the entire Malay Peninsula. This day was characterized by poor communications between signal and radio companies, which would continue to plague the British up until the campaign's conclusion. Already, the horrifying treatment of the Japanese forces toward their captives was on full display. Three airmen were accused of, quote, taking Japanese lives and destroying Japanese property, unquote, and were summarily beheaded with samurai swords on a beach. The RAF was truly unprepared for such a massive loss of trained pilots and aircrafts. A sad byproduct of the failure of British arms was the horrifying treatment handed out to civilians by British officials. Supposed fifth columnists were acting under Japanese command and attempting to sabotage the British armed forces. Colin Smith says, quote, People were shot for allegedly calling in dive bombers with the wave of a white tope or by placing newly washed sarongs on a bush to dry. An Argyle, whose younger brother had been killed a couple of days before, was selected by the adjutant to take two civilians suspected of putting down markers and, quote, do what you want with them, unquote. It's important to stress some of these men and women may have been guilty, but we might not ever discover the truth of that matter. Of the retreat from Kota Baru, Japanese newspapers gleefully remarked, quote, The enemy, realizing the indomitable courage of the Imperial Army, dispersed to deep into the coconut groves, like little spiders routed by mosquitoes. Unquote. Colin Smith says, quote, The reality 
was more like murder in the dark, unquote. Indian units became hopelessly intermingled in the retreat, and all cohesion fell apart. The only thing holding the line were the mountain guns commanded by Captain Close. He fought until his ammunition was gone, and he found himself the first of many British officers to be taken prisoner by Japan. Needless to say, he was tortured, but he never revealed more than his name, rank, and number. Upon the declaration of war, Captain Phillips set out immediately for Japanese-controlled waters. British honor was at stake, as well as what Phillips referred to as the, quote, 300-year tradition, unquote. Phillips believed in his big ships and their anti-aircraft guns. They were searching for the two biggest Japanese ships in the area, one of which was of British design. As an added precaution, the master Japanese admiral, Yamamoto, made a point to build up anti-naval aircraft units in the vicinity. As the Prince of Wales and Repulse entered their range, over 140 aircrafts were devoted solely to hunting down the two British ships. Phillips maintained radio silence as his ships entered the South China Sea. The task force was first spotted by Japanese submarines, and 60 Japanese torpedo-armed aircraft were dispatched to meet them. Captain Phillips remained blissfully unaware of the fact that all forms of surprise had been lost. He proclaimed to his men, quote, Fat transports lie off the coast. We have made a wide circuit to avoid air reconnaissance and hope to surprise the enemy shortly after sunrise tomorrow. We may have the luck to try our mettle against the old battle cruiser Congo or against some Japanese cruisers and destroyers which are reported to be in the Gulf of Siam. We are sure to get some useful practice with HA armament, which are high-angle aircraft guns. Whatever we meet, I want to finish quickly, and so get well clear to the eastward before the Japanese can mount too formidable a scale of attack against us. So shoot to sink. Unquote. Despite the heat, the thousands of sailors on the two ships were ordered into long shirts and trousers. If a shell failed to pierce the battleship's armor, the searing heat it generated could scorch you to your bones. Battle would not come today. Instead, they received confirmation their task force had been spotted by Japanese aircraft. This whole time, radio silence was strictly observed, leaving the Japanese with more of an idea of Captain Phillips' whereabouts than his British superiors. December 10th began with another sighting of Japanese aircrafts. By 11.15 a.m., the first shot was fired from the Prince of Wales at a squadron of eight Japanese bombers called Nels. The guns were unleashed in full force, and several Nels were hit, but none too badly. The Nels dropped their deadly cargo over the repulse at 11,500 feet. One of the bombs hit home, boring a 15-inch wide hole through the repulse's deck and exploding on an armored deck just above the boiler room where several stokers were severely burned from exploding steam pipes and dripping hot oil. Trapped in their small confines, several shimmied their way up a small ventilation shaft, only to discover that the way was screwed shut and had to be manually removed in order to extricate the burned and screaming men. The Japanese continued to converge around the ships. Now they had over 70 planes preparing for bombing and torpedo runs. Nine torpedo-armed planes descended on the Prince of Wales. They approached quickly, dropping their torpedoes in a crescent formation. The Prince of Wales was desperately wounded. One of the torpedoes exploded almost directly underneath the ship, completely destroying the port-side propeller and severely damaging its adjoining shaft. A twelve-foot hole and the unmistakable sound of the ocean filling the massive warship were the only notice that something terrible had happened. Damage teams went to work straight away, attempting to fix the electrical damage while also keeping the ship afloat as it fought on. This one torpedo strike caused the entire ship to turn in a constant semicircle as the wheel no longer responded to the helmsman's pull. There were fifty more aircrafts coming, all honing in on the wounded but not yet destroyed Prince of Wales. It was not just torpedoes worrying them, as they turned Japanese bombers would take aim at the decks of the ship, 
and unload their machine guns at the unprotected Britons, who fired back with their pom-pom guns. This whole time, not a single message was sent to the British High Command back in Singapore. The first would be sent at 11.58 a.m., over 45 minutes after the shooting started. The Japanese forces began to zero in. They descended on the Prince of Wales like a monsoon. Japanese Bettys soon joined the swarm of Nels. These were larger, more powerful bombers, and they carried a massive 450-pound warhead. On their run, two of the bombs hit home. One tore a hole right through the Prince of Wales, while the other mangled the outer starboard propeller. Now the Prince of Wales was traveling at a hobbled eight knots, or just over nine miles per hour. The Prince of Wales had taken on over 18,000 tons of water at this point. The remnants of the RAF were quickly scrambled in an attempt to save the listless vessel. But because they were not in proximity to the battle, they arrived much later than needed. Meanwhile, the repulse was dodging torpedoes which seemed to be coming from all directions. Captain Tennant did a masterful job weaving in and out of the way of incoming projectiles, but his luck ran out. A torpedo had lodged itself in the repulse's so-called torpedo bulge. This garish protrusion offered a modicum of protection, but the ship still listed to one side. Thanks to damaged crew efforts, the ship maintained a steady pace of 25 knots. Both ships still had incredibly dangerous anti-air weapons. The first Japanese planes were shot down by British ships. In one such case, a young sailor recounted, quote, Although it was clear the men inside had only seconds to live, I watched with undiluted pleasure. We all cheered, unquote. However, in the same run, five torpedoes would slam into the repulse. The sea rushed into the vessel, and the order was given to abandon ship. The men came out of the ship through the captain's lobby flat, where dozens of wounded piled up on the floors. In eight minutes, the repulse would be on the bottom of the ocean. Many of these wounded were left to drown. Some men clambered over the sides, but once they were in the water, they found that it was completely polluted with their former ship's oil which choked up and made ill the men who were unfortunate enough to swallow some of the oily water. Additionally, heavy equipment which was not bolted down caused another hazard as it fell overboard. Most sailors chose the route over the sloping deck to the starboard side. This route became more precarious the longer you waited, and one of the last sailors off the sinking ship had to make a sixty-foot dive into the murky waters below. The hundreds of sailors in the water now had oil clinging to their skin, hair, and clothes. As the repulse went down, midshipman Robert Davies fastened himself to an anti-aircraft gun and continued to fire at passing aircrafts. The 18-year-old would be lost, along with Captain Tennant, who was last heard shouting, quote, You put up a good show. Now look after yourself and God bless you, unquote. The Prince of Wales was still aimlessly circling some four miles off. Captain Phillips watched as the repulse went under, and he dispatched several destroyers to search for survivors. Meanwhile, Hachiro Takeda's Nels were flying in tight formation, ready to deploy their bombs in unison. One of these bombs exploded in the cinema flat area, where a number of wounded sailors were ripped apart by the explosion. It was clear that the Prince of Wales was destined to join the repulse at the bottom of the South China Sea both symbols of a now bygone era. In spite of this knowledge, the order to evacuate was only given ten minutes before the ship capsized. Colin Smith contends that, quote, about half of the battleship's full complement of 1,612 officers and men was still on the ship, unquote. The ship's New Zealand chaplain, W.G. Parker, stayed with the many who were too injured to be moved. The Prince of Wales lost nearly 250 men, while the Repulse lost over 500 sailors. There were thousands of men in the ocean, attempting to clamber onto the several destroyers which were on patrol for survivors. First RAF planes began arriving at this time. The men in the water shouted up at the pilots, quote, RAF, rare as fucking fairies, unquote. In a little over two hours... The Japanese Air Force had lost 18 pilots in their respective aircrafts while killing 800 
and 40 British sailors, and sinking two expensive, irreplaceable battleships. Churchill was fast asleep when he received the phone call from the first sea lord. He could not comprehend what he was hearing. He says, quote, I, I was thankful to be alone. In all the war, I had never received a more direct shock. As I turned over and twisted in bed, the full horror of the news sank in upon me, unquote. Now there was not a single British war vessel larger than a destroyer anywhere from the Suez Canal to Southeast Asia. The British Army was fighting for its life in the paddy fields and abandoned aerodromes of northeast Malaya. Yamashita now had his full force available just over the border in Thailand. Britain finally attempted to invade Thailand to secure their own flank, but they were met with fierce resistance by civilian and Thai military alike. The Japanese advance was held up at the vital crossroads of Crow by fierce Punjabi resistance, but everywhere else the line was falling apart. This was because the Japanese practice of picking off white officers was rampant and highly effective. There were thousands of leaderless men who panicked at the furious onslaught by the Japanese. The British were hoping to rally these various elements at their first prepared defensive line, Jitra. It was here in the foothills along the coast that the 14th Punjabi constructed hastily built defenses and waited for the first Japanese tanks to roll into the sights of their boys' rifles. These were some of the only anti-tank weapons available, and they helped to somewhat even the playing field. The Jitra line fell during a Japanese night attack. Monsoon rains provided ample cover for their T-95 tanks, and they completely surprised and obliterated the defending Punjabi forces. Only 200 remained of the original 2,000-plus. Those who weren't killed or captured went into hiding and disguised themselves as Tamil rubber workers. The Japanese were causing havoc amongst and behind British lines. Small parties of Japanese would penetrate deep behind British positions and attempt to coax the British into retreating by making as much noise and sound as possible. This often worked with undertrained and weary troops who believed that they were now surrounded. These small hit parties were soon known as jitter parties. The British retreated to the next most defensible line, along the river Keda. Another major failing in British preparation was their communication system. They barely functioned in the humid jungle terrain. Radios were unreliable at best, and the archaic runner was often used to convey messages. Meanwhile, the Japanese troops were blazing through the jungle, using motorcycle squads as raiders and light cavalry. Along the river Keda, the town of Garoon would serve as a natural choke point, which would heavily benefit the defender. The British were exhausted. Many had only slept an average of four hours a night, usually on the ground being bitten by mosquitoes. The Japanese would not let the British rest. The town of Yen was stormed, and Garoon village, the epicenter of the defense, was exposed to attack. Leader of the 6th Brigade, Billy Kay, decided a counterattack was needed to hold up the Japanese advance. The counterattack held the Japanese forces for the rest of the day, until reinforcements arrived and pushed out the British penetration. The Japanese soldiers would continue their route of Allied forces. They pushed into the Surrey Battalion HQ and killed every officer inside. They moved on to the Brigade HQ, where the Brigadier escaped after falling through a hole in the floor while his staff was butchered with bayonets and samurai swords. Around this time, the island of Penang was bombed by the Japanese Air Force. Over 1,000 civilians would die, and another 2,000 would be wounded. The hobbled RAF had no resources available to keep the island, and they left it to its fate. The Japanese stormed in, and over the still intact radio station, they would say, quote, Hello, Singapore. This is Penang calling. How do you like our bombing? Unquote. They followed this by setting up recruiting offices for former Indian soldiers. One of the first things the Japanese forces did upon retaking the city was murder the local head of the United China Relief Fund in front of his entire family. The situation was precarious, but Percival believed there was still hope. He had not yet deployed the vaunted Australians. Additionally, reinforcements were newly earmarked for Malaya and Burma, 
he hoped they would be able to turn the tide of the war. Along the line of retreat, there was a single bright spot. The Argyles were fighting an incredible rearguard action. They set up repeated ambushes for Japanese infantry, and often annihilated whole patrols before reinforcements could arrive. They had been training with incredible vigor in Malaya for the past two years, and they became elite jungle fighters. Jungle, or bush fighting, as the Argyles called it, was defined by, quote, resourcefulness and, above all, aggressiveness and intense speed, for only by these means can the initiative be kept, and to lose the initiative in the jungle is death, unquote. The Argyles would soon develop their own jitter parties called tiger patrols. They would devastate the rear and flanks of enemy formations, as the main force held the Japanese forces at the front. Colin Smith says, quote, The road was the all-important tactical feature, almost the only one, unquote. Whoever controlled the road controlled the battle. This was done in two ways, first through the aforementioned encircling parties, or through filleting. Filleting was achieved through heavy firepower and aggressiveness, literally cutting a force of infantry in two. These were the same tactics the Japanese used to destroy the positions on the Keita River. South of the Kampar River, the newest positions were being prepared by British sappers and engineers. The Argyles were in a vanguard position, ready to receive the Japanese, but they were not ready for tanks. They were filleted by the Japanese armor, scurrying into the jungle, and completely cut off. British sappers were ordered to blow the bridge of the Kampar River stranding many Argyles on the other side. It was New Year's Day, and it seemed to promise a year of unyielding war. Singapore was under constant bomber harassment, killing civilians and personnel around the Sembawang airfield. As 1942 began, Sir Archibald Wavell was placed in command of the entire Eastern Theater. From India to the Indonesian islands, all Allied forces were under his command. He had an impossible job, but he had already defied the odds in North Africa, where his forces, while being highly outnumbered, gained ground against incompetent Italian armies. In a major move, which would have future implications, the British warily agreed to allow the Malay Communist Party to operate clandestinely behind enemy lines. They would fight a guerrilla war with the Japanese soldiers, holding up troops and sabotaging infrastructure. This whole time... British positions were being overrun, and soldiers would simply leave supplies which were too heavy to carry. As 1942 began, many Japanese infantrymen were armed with Tommy guns and Brens. They called these, quote, Churchill supplies, unquote. They found this kit much more effective than their bolt-action rifles and awkward Nambu 96 machine guns. South of the Kampar River lies the forested Kampar Hill, the surrounding countryside was a sparse monoculture of rubber trees. Atop this hill, British artillery could finally call out targets and lay accurate supporting fire without the hindrance of dense jungle. The Japanese could not get as close as they once did, and were forced to crawl toward the enemy, using the dark as cover. New Year's Day opened with a massive Japanese attack aimed at the British artillery atop the hill. The British responded with an accurate and devastating barrage, calling in fire from within 50 yards. The Japanese attacks were completely broken apart. Small parties drifted into the jungle and attempted to carry out infiltration attacks. They succeeded in capturing nearby Thompson's Ridge. John Graham and his company, composed of Sikh and Hindu troops, was given the assignment to recapture the ridge in a daring night attack. The Indian soldiers fixed their 17-inch-long bayonets and charged. Japanese mortar fire was attempting to hold the line. One mortar exploded right under John Graham's legs, mangling both from the knee down. He cried his men forward and continued to chuck grenades at enemy positions. The fight was furious, but the Indians were victorious. Graham was told of the ridge's capture and finally succumbed to blood loss. Yamashita was running the risk of being bogged down attempting to capture tactically sound defensive ground. He utilized his naval superiority to outflank the Kampar positions, landing several forces on the western coast of Malaya. In three separate attacks, 
the Emperor's elite guard division smothered any British resistance in their way. As it stood, Percival ordered the Campar position abandoned in favor of the newly dug entrenchments on the Slim River. The Punjabi forces were left to fight a desperate rearguard action. They decimated an entire Japanese patrol before falling back in good order. The constant state of retreats did nothing for British morale, and the men were completely exhausted and worn out. At Slim River, Yamashita was finally able to utilize his armor. They launched a lightning operation that bowled over the British in their way. The British were extremely lacking in anti-tank weapons, as the boys' rifles were too heavy to carry on harassed retreats. The only other tank weapon was the Molotov cocktail. Originally used in the Spanish Civil War, it gained its name during the Russian Winter War with Finland. With this lack of equipment and preparation, it's easy to understand how the Japanese experienced success after success. The only effective resistance was put up by the Argyles, but after their position was cut in two, the Argyles fled into the jungle and were hunted down. For six weeks, members of the Scottish regiment trekked through rainforest and river, doing all they could to return to British positions. In one instance, a group of 90 men fought their way to a bridge, only to be surrounded. The Japanese separated the wounded and killed those who couldn't walk. Further south, the column of Japanese tanks came across two companies of Punjabi infantry. The 250 soldiers were in marching formation, never expecting to come upon Japanese tanks. They were virtually wiped out. Captain Tom Mooney attempted to hold the advance. He fired madly at the tanks with his revolver before being mowed down. Once more, over 500 Gurkhas were in the path of the Japanese armor column, and they were swiftly decimated. In the next day's roll call, a single officer and 27 individuals were left to answer. After a 19-mile-long penetration, the tank column turned back, having utterly devastated position after position. The British High Command was in chaos. The decision was made to abandon central Malaya. Kuala Lumpur and Malacca would be left to the Japanese. The new defensive line would be 120 miles north of Singapore and would range from coast to coast. It was finally time for the Australians under General Bennett to be sent into action. Bennett had long claimed that, quote, a single Australian was worth four Japanese, unquote. His men first saw action on the railway junction town, Ogemas. They placed themselves in the perfect position for ambush and waited for 400 Japanese soldiers to pass a bridge before opening fire. Without suffering a single casualty, they inflicted at least 120 casualties on the Japanese. Over the next two days, the Australians would fight tooth and nail against Japanese armor and infantry. Colonel Suji says the Australians, quote, fought with a bravery we had not previously seen, unquote. The Australians claimed they would not only hold the Japanese attack, but put them on the defensive. Yamashita responded to this new threat by going around the static Allied position and landing several detachments of men behind the Australian flank. The Japanese had landed close to the Muar River, and within 24 hours they were on the way to destroying the Indian Brigade which was defending it. At Bakri, the remnants of the brigade were attempting to hold against the Imperial Guards. Another spearhead of tanks was sent in an attempt to recreate the storming of Slim River. All six tanks were destroyed by reinforcing Australian anti-tank guns. In spite of this setback, the Japanese continued their advance. Bakri had to hold or the entire British position on the Malay Peninsula was in jeopardy. To make matters worse, Japanese detachments had landed behind Bakri and had disappeared into the jungle. Troops were bustled in to hold the front at all hazard. During an officer's conference, a direct hit was scored on Brigade HQ by a Japanese bomber. Body parts littered the road junction. A survivor says, quote, Just beside the road, a naked waist with two twisted legs lay about two yards from a scarred, bleeding head with a neck, half a chest, and one arm, unquote. Around Bakri, the siege of the town was progressing slowly. The Japanese were perturbed by the fierce resistance the Australians were putting up, as they were counterattacking and retaking positions inside the town. Captain Anderson was the one in charge of the hodgepodge of Allied troops in and around Bakri. He was unable to hold, and he knew it, 
he was given permission to retreat on January 20th. They attempted to finagle their way to the coast and find a boat or some other transport there. Anderson's column was well on the road when they encountered their first of many roadblocks. Held up by machine guns, Anderson decided he would deal with the threat personally. Colin Smith says, quote, Anderson, accompanied by a private Donnelly, who acted as his Batman cum bodyguard, announced that he would try and deal with them. Sometimes crawling, sometimes moving from tree to tree, Anderson approached the Japanese. Once he was reasonably sure that his grenades would be on target, he let fly. When one of the survivors unwisely put his head up, the bespectacled Anderson yelled out, Mine, Donnelly, and immediately killed him with his four fifty five revolver. Unquote. They moved by night, sending sporadic scouting parties into the jungle and the local villages. After a bitter series of marches, the long column of wounded and exhausted men entered Perit Salong on March 2nd. They had to fight for control of the small village. The elite Japanese guards opposed them. The vanguard of Anderson's column was making good headway, but his flanks and rear were buckling under the Japanese attacks. During the night, the jitter parties went to work calling out, quote, Where are you, Joe? Tomorrow you die, unquote. Joe was the nickname they had given the Australian soldiers they were facing. Attempts were made to save Anderson's column, but none could be supported by artillery and all surprise was lost. Anderson's column was well and truly trapped. Anderson ordered those still able to walk to disperse into the jungle once more. The wounded were to be left for the Japanese to capture. The Japanese forces bayoneted or clubbed to death the wounded who were unable to walk and mocked and beat those in their custody. One Indian soldier who had his hand blown off was beaten unconscious and stabbed repeatedly with a bayonet and thrown into a drainage ditch. He still clung to life, but when he came up for air, he was shot in the head. The wounded were now all moved to a bungalow, where the head of the Imperial Guard Division, General Nishimura, ordered the, quote, disposal, unquote, of any remaining prisoners. They were roped together and killed en masse, but several escaped by playing dead. The Japanese forces would go through the wounded by running through them with their bayonets, killing anyone who might still be alive. It's important to stress this was not the behavior of all Japanese troops. However, these atrocities were still committed. The Malayan Peninsula was almost entirely lost. Percival attempted a last desperate stand at the Batu Pahat Mersing Line on the southern tip of Eurasia. Around this time, the last offensive operations of the RAF took place. Twenty-one World War I-era wildebeest and several newer model albacores took to the skies. Flying in tandem with this bomber squadron were 15 buffaloes and eight of the newly arrived hurricane fighters. Even with the newly added hurricanes, they were up against impossible odds and they knew it. The pilots must have realized they were flying into what was essentially a suicide mission. Ten wildebeests were destroyed, two of the albacores, two Hudsons, and one of the brand new hurricanes. One pilot survived the crash of his plane, only to be executed by Japanese forces on the ground. The damage they caused to their own occupied airfield was slight. It was a desperate effort that only made the state of things clearer. Along the Batu Pahat Mersing line, the Japanese continuously penetrated deep into British territory using their bicycles to quickly navigate the small country roads. The British did all they could, but they were over-encumbered with trucks, radios, and supplies, ammunition, and most seriously, lack of sleep. These same problems did not affect the Japanese, who opted for a much more mobile approach to fighting. They quickly overran the tired British units defending the crucial choke points across Batu Pahat and Mersing. In no time at all, the retreat to Singapore was called... Thousands of British, Indian, and Australian soldiers were now trapped on the other side of the causeway, which was promptly blown up. As February began, all that was left of the 200-year-old British Dominion was the island of Singapore. Churchill demanded a defense worthy of the great last stands in British history. He would not be satisfied unless Singapore's defense was truly heroic and truly good for publicity. Churchill said as much, quote, I want to make it absolutely clear that I expect every inch of ground to be defended. 
every scrap of material or defenses to be blown to pieces to prevent capture by the enemy, and no question of surrender until after protracted fighting in the ruins of Singapore. Unquote. The odds were seemingly in Percival's favor. He had over 70,000 men available for defense, while the Japanese had just over 30,000. Additionally, British artillery dominated the field when compared to its Japanese counterparts. Unfortunately, this was not the whole story. The Japanese had complete air control and complete control of the waves. Percival's men were dog-tired. They were not used to combat. Whenever they fought, they were met with defeat. It engendered terrible morale among the entire army. Even the vaunted Australians were showing that they were all too human. Inside Singapore, the island was preparing for a long siege, but authorities did all they could to make it seem like business as usual. They forbade the word siege in any newspapers, considering it, quote, defeatist, unquote. Percival seems to be absolutely obsessed with his troops' morale. He refused to allow his head engineers to build defenses facing Malaya, leaving the northern end of Singapore practically defenseless. This was all done in the hopes of improving morale. Percival never considered that a lack of defenses in an obvious siege situation would actually deteriorate morale even further. It was an incredibly poor choice, and it proved to be one of the many reasons Singapore did not hold out in the battle to come. When Churchill heard there was no land-facing guns in Singapore, he was absolutely shocked, saying, quote, The possibility of Singapore having no landward defenses no more entered my mind than that of a battleship being launched without a bottom. I saw before me this spectacle of the almost naked island. Unquote. Yamashita unleashed his air force and his own artillery on the city, targeting the Sembawang naval and air base specifically. With this increase in attacks, the decision was made to preemptively destroy the base and deny any supply to the Japanese. The Royal Navy, which had defended British assets since the time of Henry VIII, would not defend Singapore. The 300-odd personnel still on the island promptly departed, leaving a burnt-out shell of a naval base and an anxious population behind. At this point, Percival was under no illusions. He could not hold Singapore, he could only delay the inevitable. As the Battle of Singapore began, the first trickling of news from the outside world was reaching Singapore. In Hong Kong, Japanese soldiers were murdering wounded Britons in their hospital beds and raping the nurses who were trying to protect them. The word spread rapidly. Civilians should start to be evacuated. The first to go were the white people, who, due to their privilege and status, found refuge almost anywhere. The Chinese and Malayan citizens were basically told, you're on your own. There were some attempts to let 5,000 Asians into Australia, but Australian Prime Minister John Curtin would not allow it. Australia was still practicing a, quote, white Australia, unquote, policy. And in their supreme generosity, they allowed 50 Eurasians into their country. Nice job. In Singapore, the massive petrol reserve stations were the first thing to go. These stations were blown up, causing the burning oil to form a thick black cloud over the entire island, leaving black soot hanging in the humid, mucky air. This made it impossible to call an accurate artillery fire. Yamashita targeted these fuel reserves because he was unnerved at the prospect of the fuel being used to set the straits between Singapore and the Malay Peninsula on fire. To hold Singapore, the British would have needed to address literally hundreds of problem areas. This ended up being an inefficient use of the manpower Percival had on hand, as he was constantly worried about a landing from the south of the island. At this time, the city made up only, quote, nine of the island's 350 square miles, unquote. The rest was mangrove swamp, fields, hills, and marshland each more inhospitable for a soldier than the last. This, in turn, made much of the land indefensible. One soldier said of his position, quote, It was a situation that would not offer the troops a glimmer of hope. Unquote. The officers were doing all they could to keep the morale of their men up. Much was made of the mass amount of supplies and the brimming water reservoirs on the island. 
Sir Shenton Thomas, the island's governor, proclaimed, quote, Singapore must stand, it shall stand, unquote. This soon became the slogan printed across the local newspaper. Everything was done to exalt the troops and the prowess of British arms. The men were reminded of the Marne, Waterloo, and Rourke's Drift. They had an entire nation's military prestige on their shoulders. They could not afford to lose face. All this talk of glory and heroism meant little to an Indian soldier suffering from malaria in a bombed-out trench, nor a Chinese civilian buried in the rubble of the house in which he was barely paid to tend. On the other side of the straits, thousands of Japanese troops were preparing for the final climactic attack on Singapore. Yamashita wanted to take Singapore by February 11th. In Japanese history, February 11th marks the mythical birthday of the founder of the country and the first emperor, Jimu Tino. This day is called Kigensetsu. In the last 55 days, Yamashita had captured all of British Malaya, but 1,793 of his men were killed and 2,772 were wounded. His army, however, killed 5,000 British soldiers and captured over 11,000 more, most of them being Indian troops who would go on to serve in the Japanese army. It was a nearly impossible feat, which occurred so quickly that it allowed the Japanese to advance their timetables on their invasions of Indonesia and Burma. The invasion was earmarked for dusk on February 7th, but this would be postponed until February 8th. To cross the straits, Yamashita used hundreds of collapsible pontoons made of plywood and rubber, which were attached to small engines. When these incredible vessels were latched together, they could support the transport of up to 16 tons of supplies. Yamashita would be able to transfer his armor over the fast-moving straits. He just needed a beachhead on the island. The British were unaware of these pontoons, but they understood that a preemptive bombardment was coming, and before long, the 1st Infantry would be amongst them. Percival had two switch lines prepared for a more elastic defense of the area. A switch line is a defensive line along the flank of an army. The first of these lines was on the eastern side of the island, the Sarangoon Line. The second was located to the west. It was called the Kranji Jirong Line. It was in these last days that local Chinese and Malay volunteers were allowed to fight alongside the British military. They were armed with shotguns and World War I era rifles, but they were incredibly enthusiastic. They were unfortunately frequent targets of friendly fire. Yamashita's bombardment had the desired effect. It had made many soldiers crack up. It also destroyed much of the communications which had existed between units. Wire and telephone poles were smashed during the 200-gun artillery bombardment. By 8.30, when the bombardment finally let up, it was followed by the unmistakable hum of small boat engines. On the Japanese side, the men gave their last prayers to their Shinto gods, and some tapped the small cigarette cases they had in their breast pockets. In these cigarette cases, many carried the cremated remains of friends. They had promised each other they would make it to Singapore one way or another. In the Shinto religion, cremation was the usual form of burial, on the campaign trail, it was often impossible to cremate an entire body, so many Japanese soldiers would remove a hand or finger from their fallen comrade and cremate it themselves over a fire. This was the moment for which they had sacrificed and lost so much. This attack would vindicate Japan and begin a new era in world history. For some reason, British searchlight crews were not operating. British machine guns were firing into the dark, wasting ammunition and becoming increasingly alarmed as the boat engines grew closer. The boat crews were positioned for a bulge in the Allied lines. Yamashita immediately saw this as a perfect place to launch his attack. This was a tactic he learned in Germany, called the Schwerpunkt, or the point in the line which is thinly defended, where one could concentrate their forces and achieve a complete breakthrough. As the boats approached... Flares from Allied positions began to go off, illuminating several of the boats. The men opened fire with their Brens, but there was no supporting artillery barrage accompanying their fire. Soldiers were wondering where in the world their support was, as the first Japanese landing craft hit Singapore Island. 
in the first waves. Private Kiyochi Yamamoto, a pilot for one of these pontoons, received a direct blast from a mortar shell, but still managed to pilot his craft to the other side. Not until his landing craft had reached Singapore did he die. It was revealed his right lung was protruding from the mush that was left of his rib cage. Sergeant Arai Mutsuo was a member of the second wave. He says, quote, Nine corpses floated in the water, head upwards, in a line next to each other. Were they shot while crossing, and then washed up, or after they had landed? But reflections be hanged. Quick, cut off a wrist or a finger of each dead man. Chop, chop, chop. Into a box. There's no time to bury them. Just a quick prayer. Rest in peace. Then, forward. Unquote. Within four hours, the Australians defending the stretch of beach were overrun and their brigade completely disintegrated. It was utter chaos on the British side. Artillery had only now begun to fire, but they had no sight lines. One reply to their beseeching questions was, quote, bring down fire everywhere, unquote. The Japanese had very simple instructions. Rendezvous at the Tenga airfield. By the end of the first day of the Battle of Singapore, a mess of intertwined units of various nationalities fought each other in the confused night. In the morning of February 9th, exhausted Japanese units were running out of steam and finding themselves held up by small pockets of determined resistance. The Australians began to act this day like an army unto themselves. They started retreating without orders and not informing their fellow Indian and British brigades of their choices, which went against direct orders from Percival. Still not in the fight were the Imperial Guards of Japan. They would be sent against these same Australians that night. Once more, Allied artillery was slow to respond, but they answered much more quickly than the night before. As the first waves of Japanese troops landed, a fuel silo by the Straits was empty, and two million gallons of fuel contaminated the nearest estuary. This started a fire on the water, which carried to the entire Strait. Japanese vessels and men were caught up in the blaze. One survivor of this inferno was Corporal Tsushikane Tominosuke. He wrote of his experience, quote, Another shell exploded near the soldiers I had just left. Mother, mother, don't die, don't die, you must not. Close to me, fire lashed out over the mangroves and set it on fire. It spread quickly, feeding on oil poured into the straits. Mother, mother, the moaning voice could still be heard. It was a picture of hell, Abiyokan, Buddhism's worst of all hells. It seemed impossible to advance or retreat. They were all covered with heavy black oil. Unquote. The fight was not going the way the Japanese had intended, but as the fire continued to engulf everything, the Australians inexplicably began a retreat. This gave the Japanese the time they needed to regroup and launch a devastating bayonet charge on the outnumbered Australian rear guard. Tsushikani recalls his running down of an Australian soldier who attempted to flee the horrifying hand-to-hand -hand combat. He impaled the man with his bayonet and said of the scene around him, quote, Having lost their nerve, some soldiers were simply cowering in terror, squatting down and avoiding hand-to-hand -hand combat. They too were bayoneted or shot without mercy, unquote. Around this same time, the last of the RAF planes were sent to Sumatran airfields. Singapore was abandoned once more. Now only the army remained, and they were growing increasingly mutinous. There were countless examples of desertion and insubordination. With the failure to hold either side of the blown causeway, the battle was now for Bukit Tama, a small village on the outskirts of Singapore city proper. It contained much of the ammunition and artillery the British had on hand, and its loss would be irreplaceable. On top of all this, the Kranji Jirang line was lost, not through a Japanese offensive, but by formation after formation, inexplicably falling farther and farther back. Churchill was furious at the news trickling back to London. He made it clear his feelings, quote, There must be, at this stage, no thought of saving the troops or sparing the population. The battle must be fought to the bitter end at all costs. The honor of the British Empire and the British Army are at stake. Unquote. Wavell, supreme commander in the East, put his own spin on the message, saying, quote, 
It will be a lasting disgrace if we are defeated by an army of clever gangsters, many times inferior in number." Unquote. A counterattack on Japanese positions was called for the morning, but the Japanese were pushing up their armor for their own nighttime assault. It took 20 minutes for the vanguard Argyles to be bowled over by the Japanese T-95s. They had not a single piece of anti-tank equipment, save for a handful of mines. But 20 minutes was all that was needed for Australian reinforcements, armed with boys' rifles, to cripple the oncoming column. The morning of Kegensetsu began with the Japanese Air Force dropping not bombs, but small festive sticks with string attached. Inside the hollowed-out sticks were small letters addressed to Arthur Percival. It advised Percival to, quote, Surrender the whole force in Malaya. My sincere respect is due to your army, which, true to the traditional spirit of Great Britain, is bravely defending Singapore, which now stands isolated and unaided. Many fierce fights have been fought by your gallant men and officers to the honor of British warriorship. But the development of the general war situation has already sealed the fate of Singapore. I expect that your excellency... Accepting my advice will give up this meaningless and desperate resistance. If, on the contrary, your excellency should neglect my advice, I shall be obliged, though reluctantly from humanitarian considerations, to order my army to make annihilating attacks on Singapore. Unquote. It goes on to state the terms of surrender. Yamashita was no bluffing man. He was preparing a massive advance in the face of the held-up tank attack. This day, while being a holy one in Japan, was Armageddon for the men in Singapore. Australians were bayoneted in their sleep, while Japanese jitter parties caused ruckus, getting ever closer to Singapore City. In one instance, Lieutenant Victor Mentaplay became incensed when he witnessed Japanese soldiers killing the wounded and, quote, charged the Japanese with his bayonet. The Japanese who was on slightly higher ground, met the attack, and Vic's rush carried him onto the point of the Japanese bayonet, which entered his throat under his chin and came out of the back of his neck. He threw himself backwards off the bayonet and fell on the flat of his back. Pulling his revolver from his waistband, he shot the Japanese and then, seeing red, rushed at the other Japanese in the vicinity. Unquote. Mentaplay would go on to empty his revolver at a machine gun crew, and then throw the empty gun at his assailants. Miraculously, he was not killed, as the machine gun crew assumed they were under grenade attack when they saw the revolver fly at them. Although some troops were highly capable individually, the majority of the forces lacked cohesion. Deserters now outnumbered the wounded. With the loss of Bukit Tama, something had to be done to stabilize the British front. A cobbled-together brigade known as Tom Force was ordered to recapture this central village. Their attack made serious headway, but the never-ending Japanese bombing runs eventually froze the British advance entirely. The Japanese forces quickly countered attack and pushed Tom Force out of the village with harassing mortar and machine gun fire. That night, Percival telegraphed the declaration of surrender to Wavell in Java. The decision was made to retreat the entire army to the bowels of the city itself. From here, the British had no other fallback position. To state the reality of the situation, Colin Smith says, quote, water would become as important as ammunition, unquote. Things went from bad to worse, as Japanese armor bowled over any and all resistance, only being held up at Nisun, where Garhwalis, armed with proper anti-tank equipment, were wrecking Japanese tanks. Getting civilians out immediately was now paramount, but it soon became an incredibly dangerous prospect. Japanese submarines and torpedo-armed planes destroyed any vessel not sporting the rising sun. Women had an hour to pack and leave before making their way through crowds of scared-looking soldiers who were doing anything they could to escape. Chinese citizens were forced to stay and watch Europeans and Australians clamoring to safety, all while knowing they were in the most immediate danger when the Japanese arrived. On the Empire Star... A recently converted pleasure liner, thousands of civilians and deserting soldiers crowded the deck when they were attacked by Japanese aircraft. Fourteen were killed and another forty were seriously wounded. The bravery of the Allied nurses was on full display. In many cases, they threw themselves over the wounded as planes made their next pass.
The Empire Star escaped any further torment and miraculously arrived in Sumatra. But British vessels throughout this part of the world were being continuously destroyed by the Japanese forces. It's estimated that of the 5,000 travelers headed to Australia or India, only 1,250 reached their final destinations. The worst atrocity was the Viner Brook. Spotted just outside Sumatran waters, the liner was bombed relentlessly by the Japanese Air Force. One bomb went right down the ship's funnel and exploded on the crowded deck. The floor was slick with blood, and the Viner Brook was going down fast. Twelve nurses and sixty-five civilians were killed. Fifty-three nurses and one hundred other civilian servicemen and crew found themselves washed up on one of the Banka Islands. Unfortunately for them, these same islands had recently been occupied by the Japanese. The men and the women were separated by their captors. The men were forced to line up and face the sea. It was clear to Ernest Lloyd what was about to happen. He jumped into the sea when the shooting started and witnessed the entire scene. All of his friends, crewmen, and countrymen were shot and then stabbed repeatedly. The nurses were next. They were made to line up amongst the bodies. The head nurse said, quote, Chin up, girls. I'm proud of you, and I love you all. Unquote. They were then all ordered to march into the sea. They did it, and they were nearly all killed. One nurse survived, using the current of the ocean to carry her away from the scene, after a bullet passed harmlessly through her hip. Back in Singapore, the final fights for the island were ensuing. In the no-man's land between the advanced elements of either side stood the Alexander Hospital. It held hundreds of wounded Allied soldiers and had only recently entered this middle ground following an Allied retreat. The Japanese were storming the hospital. They went methodically through the rooms, killing the wounded. One corporal was impaled on the operating table. In the end, over 320 people were killed. Many doctors gave their lives attempting to save their patients. As the men and women in Alexander Hospital were being butchered, the Malays had only recently been brought up to show their mettle. Malays were a part of the regular standing army, but had hitherto been used purely as a garrison force. Once employed against the Japanese, they showed themselves to be up to the task of fighting for their homeland. These isolated performances could not outdo the over 7,000 deserters the Allies now had. Hundreds of infantrymen loitered the streets of Singapore, often drunk, telling anyone who would listen that they were beaten. The state of things seemed to suggest just that. Everything was being destroyed or burned. Even alcohol was ordered to be poured away and barrels smashed. The 15th of February began with Percival attending a morning mass at the cathedral that doubled as a military hospital. Amidst the cries for water and the groans of pain, Percival finally received word from Wavell that he could surrender when he felt there was no prospect of holding. At 11.30 a.m., Two British officers arrived on the Bukit Tama Road carrying a white flag and a Union Jack. Yamashita agreed to meet Percival at the local Ford factory. It was 4.30 p.m. when the two met, and by 8.30 p.m. that night, they had reached an agreement for a ceasefire. At the cost of 9,000 casualties, the Imperial Japanese Army now found themselves the rulers of the greatest rubber-producing region in the world. British losses were 7,500 killed, 10,000 wounded, and over 120,000 captured. Keppel Harbor and the Sembawang naval bases were quickly repaired, and for the first time in its history, Singapore became a major naval repair yard. It was renamed Sayonanto, or the Light of the South. Yamashita would come to be called the Tiger of Malaya, and gain renown in military circles throughout the world. Percival would gain the distinction, probably unjustly, of being one of the worst military leaders in modern history. In reality, the failure of British arms had more to do with lack of foresight, racism, and a failure to provide necessary equipment to their men in the field. In the weeks following, Colonel Suji would begin the infamous Suk Ching, in which tens of thousands of Chinese Singaporeans were executed for being intellectuals or democratic sympathizers. We are still unsure how many Chinese Singaporeans were killed in the massacre. Their remains are still being uncovered. The Japanese prisoners of war were mercilessly interred at Changi Prison. Out of the 120,000 prisoners in internment, 
only about 6,000 would return to their families. They brought with them tales of brutality, slavery, and murder. Another 50,000 Tamil Indians would die after being enslaved and forced to ply railroads through thick jungles and mountains. However, the initial successes of fascism in the East and West was proving to be fleeting. Throughout Japanese-controlled and German-controlled areas, local resistance movements were sapping the offensive energy from the military. British soldiers, part of the aforementioned stay-behind parties, became guerrilla warriors, relying on the local populations to keep them fed and informed of Japanese troop movements. Yamashita would be moved to command the Philippine Islands. He was given the impossible task of fending off a full-scale American invasion. Following Japan's defeat, he was charged with the war crimes committed by his troops throughout the Philippines, and especially in Manila. There's some question as to Yamashita's involvement in any war crimes, as he often punished and even killed his soldiers for executing civilians and looting. His naval detachment of marines did not follow his orders to retreat from Manila, and they fought in the city until it was a shell of its former self. This procedure of charging officers with the crimes of their soldiers, even if they were unaware of the crimes being committed, is now called the Yamashita Standard. The controversial legacy of Yamashita and his execution have caused consternation in many circles. The trial for his execution went all the way to the Supreme Court. Dissenting opinion said, quote, It is not too early. It is never too early for the nation steadfastly to follow its great constitutional traditions, none older or more universally protective against unbridled power than due process of law in the trial and punishment of men, that is, of all men, whether citizens, aliens, alien enemies, or enemy belligerents. Unquote. Singapore was finally liberated by British troops on September 12, 1945. In the aftermath, there were countless instances of revenge killing and general anarchy, but law and order quickly returned to the streets. Alongside the victorious British regular army, the Malayan Communist Party descended from their jungle bases as unofficial participants in their country's liberation. Their popularity spread among the peasantry, who had withstood horrific treatment from the Japanese after being abandoned by the British. In no time at all, the MCP had declared an unofficial war on British rule over Malaya. From their bases in Singapore, the British Army proved to be adept jungle fighters and became one of the only countries post-World War II to successfully put down a native rebellion. In spite of this, the people of Malaya and Singapore were fed up with their colonizers, and both states were granted their independence. It was the start of a new world for the people who inhabited the island of Singapore, they realized quickly their fortunes did not lie with the rest of Malaysia. They set out on their own, and in no time, the small, city-based island nation achieved unheard of economic success. Using a careful mixture of authoritarianism, free trade, and multinational business connections, Singapore is the only independent nation in Asia that can claim a AAA credit rating. 88% of its population are homeowners and the island ranks near the top in terms of quality of life, health care, and education, while at the same time enjoying some of the lowest infant mortality rates and little government corruption. Additionally, Singapore has emerged as a progressive, eco-friendly powerhouse, planting millions of trees and being home to the first grove of megatrees, which are essentially giant cylindrical trellises teeming with both wildlife and native flora. From its humble beginnings, Singapore has been everything from a colonial possession to a naval base to an entrepot to a petrol station to a coaling hub and even a crime den. The history of Singapore shows us that nothing is written in stone. One year, 30 people lived a miserable existence in mosquito-infested swamplands. Another year, over 5 million inhabited an island that was culturally and religiously diverse. With its strategic location and tumultuous history, Singapore is becoming more important to Westerners. China now claims the South China Sea and most of the land within it. If the West continues its policy of Chinese containment, it's become apparent that Singapore would be the bedrock for capitalist idealism. If this is the case, 
then Singapore may be called upon to be a fortress once more. The only way to prevent a similar disaster would be to learn from the past. Perhaps the only true way to avert disaster is to avoid any form of war at all. Thank you so much for listening to this series of Turning Tides. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. Singapore was such an interesting and difficult subject to cover. It's an area of the world I know shockingly little about, and I think for most people in America, especially those who have a standard education, Southeast Asia is a little discussed. Learning about the thousands of different cultural groups who called this area of the world home was a difficult task for me. However, it was an interesting and enlightening one. I find that many cultures share more similarities than differences. Humans often define themselves by their cultures, and correctly recorded history is so important because it gives us the chance to connect with parts of our culture we might not have had discovered otherwise. Regardless, I hope that this portrayal of the area, the island, and the vast kaleidoscope of people who have called this place home was informative and accurate to the feelings of those who inhabit this beautiful land. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time. In the next series, we return to America in the 1970s to cover the occupation at Wounded Knee, the American Indian movement, and the government's plan to obfuscate and refuse any attempts made by indigenous peoples to obtain sovereign territory. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.